difficulty in keeping some of our choir members awake during the services, so I've decided to keep them up behind me. <laughs> You better watch out too. Or you'll be in the corner as well. You see these flowers that are here up on the platform. Uh, they are in memory of Richard McCarthy. We had his uh, memorial service yesterday at the Key Funeral Home here in Northport. Uh, I was uh, honored to be a part of that, uh, but I was really moved. They had a honor guard that came and presented the flag to his wife. I'd never seen them do this ceremony the way that they conducted it yesterday, and I know that those who are there would tell you the same thing. And, and there's just something missing a lot of times, seems, in our society as far as an honor and a respect uh, for authority, for those who sacrifice, uh, for our country, for our flag. And just the way that they conducted themselves was really moving, and uh, all I can say is I hope that we will show that same honor and respect uh, for this fine uh, government and country that God has given us, particularly in the Constitution that's been handed down. I wanted to ask you to hold your place in Philippians chapter 2 this morning and turn with me, if you would, to the book of Judges. Judges chapter 21. In light of some recent circumstances, I wanted to speak to those to a certain extent here this morning, some of the current events and issues in our day. And I want to use that to just kind of springboard into, I guess you'd say some rubber meets the road teaching this morning. Really got a simple truth for us. The simple truth is this, there is a king. There is a king. Judges chapter 21 and verse 25, we read these words. In those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. But today, there is a king. And because there's a king, we must not do what's right in our eyes. We need to do what's right in his eyes. Let's begin with a word of prayer as we enter into these thoughts this morning. Our Father, we come to you today. Lord, we thank you Lord, for all that you've given to us. You have been so good. Good to us, most of all, through Jesus. For what we have in him. Lord, this is just the beginning in this life. All your promises, so many yet to be fulfilled as we enter into our eternal destiny. And Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, there may be some present with us today who don't know Jesus as Savior. They don't know his forgiveness, the peace, the purpose that he brings. Lord, I pray that today you draw them to yourself. The Father, for us who know you, there is a king. He has a place in our lives. First place. Lord, I ask that you'd move in our hearts in these moments, that we would give you first place at this time, and Lord, that our lives would be lived, consecrated to you. Lord, bless this time. Fill me with the Holy Spirit, and Lord, move in each of our hearts, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. When we talk about the current events, I'm sure that there are some things that come to your mind. I wanted to speak to this briefly. Just over a week ago, our state began to perform recognize homosexual marriage. This again, they result, as has often been the case, of activist judges. When you consider in our Constitution and our government's beginnings, it said that this United States would be a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And those people passed a law saying that marriage would be between one man and one woman, how, therefore, can it be unconstitutional to have such a law? There is something unconstitutional at work here, and it's the judge. Nevertheless, Job has said this, and he said it of God in Job 12 and verse 17. God leads the counselors away spoiled, and he makes the judges fools. It's not too far distant if this judge does not repent. Look at the fearsome account of this before God. But there's also this reality. If the judge had not ruled in this way, I suppose it would have been just a matter of maybe five or ten years that the people would have voted this confusion called gay marriage into law. Society as a whole has been sanctioning and normalizing and commending what God calls sin. 
Of course, this goes hand in hand with Christians being scolded, labeled extreme, and condemned for opposing. And while we as a society are welcoming the homosexuals out of the closet, the Bible believers are being pushed into the closet. Amen. You may have seen just this week, the fire chief in Atlanta, right in the midst of the Bible Belt, was removed from his position. Why? Because he dared to write a Bible study book in which he devoted just one page to discuss sexual perversion amongst which he lists homosexuality. Because of that, he was removed from his post. It was ironic in the fact that the city of Atlanta reasoned that he could not remain in his position because they want to promote diversity. Interesting to me, I would define that as tyranny. That's right, amen. To be truly diverse would be to embrace that position as well. All of this, biblically stated, is an abomination to God. Amen. He hates the practice. He condemns it in no uncertain terms. He calls such a lifestyle strange, unseemly, and the product of a reprobate mind. Nothing that society can do or say will ever change that. Amen. Now some would say in making such a statement, and I've been called this before, that it's hate speech and I'm a homophobe. Well, there's a few things I would say to that. First of all, it becomes necessary for those who have no ability to effectively debate, debate a matter to resort to name calling. Amen. Their arguments for the acceptance of that lifestyle cannot stand on their own merits, so they seek to demean the character of those that oppose them. Right. Second, I would say this, I do have a fear. It's a fear of God. Amen. I cannot accept their sin because God has promised to judge that sin and those who partner in it. In fact, it is commanded of God that I must oppose it. Amen. He has said in His Word, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, darkness but rather reprove them. Amen. He says, You're the salt of the earth. And if the salt has lost its savor, it's thenceforth good for nothing. Amen. I must oppose it. God commands me to do so. Furthermore, the Word of God says that the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Somebody better say something because the alternative is not too rosy. I also remind you that being labeled such things should not come as a surprise to us. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verses 24 to 25, He said, The disciples not above His Master nor the servant above His Lord. It's enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Yeah. And finally, I would say this. That for the Bible believer, to speak the truth with the love for God and for his neighbor is the only one who truly loves the homosexual. Yeah. It's the truth that sets people free. Yeah. The Word of God declares that the abusers of themselves with mankind shall not inherit the kingdom of God. If we do not lovingly confront them with this truth and demand as God demands that they repent, then we have left them without any hope but a certain eternal destiny in a lake of fire. Now you tell me what's the hateful thing to do. But you know the issues in our nation and what we see going on far exceed the issue of gay marriage. In our land, less than half of the children now are a part of a traditional family. It's a fact that homosexuality is welcome because we have put up and normalized premarital cohabitation, yes. because we have accepted as a norm divorce, yes. because adultery is romanticized and publicized. Right. But you know, it's not just what's going on in the arena of sexual matters, but it's the violence that's around us everywhere. You consider what's just transpired in Florida at the start of this year and since around Christmas. There was a son who decapitated his mother. There were two girls, one 15 years old and one 11 years old, who killed intentionally their 16-year-old brother. And then just this week, a father throws his five-year-old daughter off the bridge. Yeah. Meanwhile, in our land, we have senseless riots that destroy the property of people that have nothing to do with what they're upset about. Yeah. They talk about black lives mattering, and they do.
But if they really believe that, they march and they protest outside the Planned Parenthoods. Do you realize since 2001, 8 million black babies have been killed in their mother's wombs? That is the leading cause of death amongst African American people in our country. More than the other 10 leading causes put together. 8 million in just the last 14 years. Our land, drugs are legal, pornography is protected, alcohol is on every corner, gambling continues to increase. But the Bible, the truth that sets men free, the words of life, is becoming increasingly illegal. It's kicked out of our schools, it's kicked out of the armed forces, out of the public sphere. We could go on and on. The question comes to mind, what in the world is going on? Why is this happening? You know, I could look at the root cause of this, and and truly we could go in any number of directions. You might think this morning that I would look to the future. We recognize in Bible prophecy, the Bible says that iniquity would abound in the last days. It says, like it was in the days of Noah, so would it be when Jesus will come back. And what was it that was notable about the days of Noah? It says, violence covered the face of the earth. There's nowhere that we can go in the world today, but we find extreme violence and murder and atrocities. In Noah's day, there was a climax of immorality, violence, sin, It's being repeated today. But rather look to the future, I would rather this morning just to take a time and examine these current issues in light of the past. I believe that history, in particular biblical history, is going to show us the root causes of what we see present in our society today. These issues are not new problems. The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. Furthermore, we know this. Those that don't know history are doomed to repeat it. Americans are simply slow to learn history. The biblical record. You've turned to the book of Judges this morning. If you were to read, and I'm just going to kind of summarize, the final four chapters of this book give us a couple of different accounts of what was going on in that day. If you were to read Judges 17, you would find a man who fashions to him and his family a set of idols, creating his own God. After fashioning these idols, a Levite, a man who had been separated in the people of Israel to the teaching of God's Word comes along. And this man says, hey, if you will come and be my family's personal priest, then we'll pay you this much amount of money and and you'll have a free place to live. Levite says, well, that sounds pretty good. So he joins in. Well, a little while later, a group of soldiers from the tribe of Dan comes along and they steal this man's idols. The Levite runs after him. He says, whoa, what are you doing? You can't take these things. They say, why are you there just ministering to one family? Why don't you come with us and we'll make you the minister of an entire tribe? The Levite says, wow, that does sound good. So he goes with them. And we find this idolatry being set up. And a Levite, who's to be a man of God, simply following the money. Then we come to a second story man goes and he purchases to himself a concubine. In modern terms, we could say a sex slave. After dealing with that abusive situation for a while, the woman leaves the man. She runs away and she sets herself up as a prostitute. The man goes after this woman and he finds her there in a city and he speaks peaceably to her and and he entreats her and he makes all sorts of promises to her so she decides she's going to go back with him. On their journey back to his home, he stops off at a city that's located within the realm of the tribe of Benjamin, a city called Gibeah. As they go in that night to Gibeah and they sit down as strangers in that city, they're welcomed by a man and he shows them hospitality, he's providing them food, but later that evening there's a knock at the door and the house is surrounded by homosexuals. And they demand of the owner of the home. He says, bring that man out to us tonight that we might have our way with you. In order to satisfy the lusts of these men, rather than 
that man going out, he gave them that woman. The Bible says that over the course of that night, they abused her to such an extent that she died. In the morning, the man got up. He took this woman's body. He returned to his home. There he divided it into 12 pieces, her body. And he sent a segment of it to each of the tribes of Israel. Upon receiving such a thing, the other tribes of Israel said, What an abomination is this? How, how could these things be going on? And they got together a council and they said, Deliver these men who've done this deed. And the tribe of Benjamin wouldn't cooperate. So the other 11 tribes got together and said, Very well, we'll force you to give them to us. And a civil war erupted. You would think the other 11 tribes would have their way with one solitary tribe, Benjamin, but they had 700 elite sling men that could shoot with a sling. And they mowed them down time and time and time again. Thousands of men lost their lives until finally those other 11 tribes with the superior manpower was able to overcome the tribe of Benjamin. And once they came in, what did they do? They slaughtered every man, woman, boy, and girl that they could find. The tribe of Benjamin was left with 600 men, and that was it. And those 600 men fled and hid themselves. At that point, the 11 other 11, 11 tribes looked at what they had done, and they, they said, well, what's going to happen? We, we're going to lose an entire tribe of the people of Israel. What should we do? They had taken a pledge that they would not give any of their daughters to any Benjamite ever again. These 600 men without having a spouse, without having a wife, could never be able to continue that line of Benjamin. It seemed that this was the last generation. But as they did a poll, they discovered there was one city that would not send soldiers into the Civil War, the city of Jabesh Gilead. And so what did they do? As a result, they went and they slaughtered that city. Leaving behind just 400 virgins who they then took and gave to these 600 men to be their wives. With 200 men yet without a wife, they made this statement. They said, what we want you to do is we want you to go to this feast and whenever an unsuspecting, unmarried woman comes out, if you like her, grab her and she will have to be your wife, regardless of her desire, regardless of her family's desire. When you think of everything that's going on over the course of this whole account that the Lord has revealed to us today in the book of Judges, you ask yourself, if this happened 3,000 years ago, is this something going on today? Yeah. It's a lot of the same issues. Do you know the Bible gives us this reason that it was all transpired? You'll find in Judges chapter 17 and verse number 6, you'll find these words. It says there, in those days, there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. In Judges chapter 18 and verse number 1, you'll find these words. In those days, there was no king in Israel. In Judges chapter 19 and verse number 1, you'll find these words. It came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel. Again, in Judges chapter 21 and verse 25, you find these words. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Do you think that the writer of the Holy Scriptures is trying to impress a point upon us today? When they removed the king, when they removed that authority, when they had no one there with an objective standard of right and wrong, no absolute truth, no one that they feared, they simply did what they felt like doing. Without the authority to uphold God's truth in that theocracy, man simply did what seemed good to him. And what we see in the book of Judges is a byproduct of that. And it's the same thing in our society today. The king has been removed. Yeah. And man is simply doing what seems right in his own eyes. I'll remind you of a simple truth in the book of Proverbs. It says there's a way that seems right unto a man. But the end thereof is the ways of death. Genesis 3. We find Adam and Eve in the garden. Do you know it's the same temptation? Satan comes to Eve, he removes the authority. He told Eve that if she ate of that fruit, she would be a god. 
He offered to her the possibility of choosing herself what is good and evil. And mingled with those promises was this, that there would be no consequence for her actions. And the devil thereby convinced Eve, and she fell into sin as well as her husband Adam. It's the same lie, it's the same truth that we see in the book of Judges. There's no authority, there's no absolute right and wrong, there's no consequence for your actions. To boil it down, we can put it like this. No God, no truth, no hell. And that's what our society is preaching today. And the fruits are predictable. Yes, sir. You know, this is the great offer of the modern so-called theory of evolution. It is utterly satanic. It's a removal of the authority of God. It's a removal of the consequences of sin. It's an invitation to determine right and wrong, good and evil for ourselves. But it's all a farce. Let me say this as plainly as I can this morning. The theory of evolution does not exist because of science. Yes, sir. It does not exist because of scientific fact. Right. It exists because men love darkness rather than light. Yes. It's an attempt to do away with God. It's an attempt to choose for ourselves our own course of action and not think at all about God. Amen. It's society wanting to be free to do what we want to do. It's perfectly illustrated in the recent occurrence in California. There a scientist has made a series of discoveries regarding dinosaurs. Recently he found in a triceratops there was soft tissue. Tissue within that was not fossilized. Tissue that he was still able to stretch and take samples of and run DNA tests on. The simple question is, how in the world could this have survived for 70 million years? And the obvious conclusion is, it hasn't been around that long. It's only been around a few thousand years, just like the Bible said. So what did the scientific community do with this man? They fired him. Because what he found didn't fit their theory, and there can't be a God. Come on, they want to shut out the light of the truth. But today, listen, there is a God. Amen. There is a truth. It's what we hold in our hands, the Bible. There is a judgment day. There is a King. Amen. This attempt to dethrone Christ has been human history, and by the way, it'll be humanity's future, at least until eternity. Man wants to do away with God's authority. They believe the lie of the devil that God's word, that God's laws and God's commands inhibit freedom and prohibit happiness. But the law of the Lord is perfect. The testimonies of the Lord are true. Those who live by them will find freedom and happiness. And those who try to throw them off, those who, as in Psalm 2, seek to break the bands of God, are going to be judged. Why? Because there is a king. There is a judge. The righteous judge must punish evil. He will not at all acquit the wicked. And so as Psalm 2 puts it, mankind needs to repent and worship the Son. They need to repent and turn to God. Because there comes a time when his long suffering and forbearance will be exhausted, then utter desolation will fall. My fear today is that I will witness what Abraham saw. He was concerned about the city of Sodom, for in the city of Sodom were some of his loved ones, his nephew Lot and Lot's family. The Bible says that he rose up early one morning. He looked out across the plain. The Bible says, Lo, the smoke of the country went up. I fear that America might already be enduring its destruction. Yeah. Breaking apart at the seams. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the Lord gives us further time, more opportunity to repent. Perhaps He withholds His judgment so that biblical churches can continue to operate freely and support missions, the proclaiming of the truth in cities near and far. I can't say that I know the mind of God, but it would seem that we stand on the precipice of a great disaster. Yeah. This morning, I want to present to you that there's an even greater problem. There's something that troubles me even more 
troubles me more than the world living like there's not a king. And that's this. God's people are living like there's not a king. God's people have begun to govern their lives in the same manner. Their guiding light has become what seems good to them. As we look into the book of Judges, we find it wasn't just that nation as a whole, but it was God's people. In fact, if your Bible's open in the book of Judges, you'll find in Judges chapter 14, you'll find one of the judges himself, Samson, a man with supernatural strength, used of God, and yet his life turning aside. Why? Because of this simple truth. He did that which was right in his own eyes. He did what he wanted to do rather than what God wanted for him. The Bible tells us in Judges chapter 14 and verse number 1, Samson went down to Timnath and he saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. He came up and he told his father and his mother and said, I've seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore, get her for me to wife. His father and his mother said unto him, knowing the biblical command that he was to marry another Israelite, they said to him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren? Or among all my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And listen to Samson's words. Samson said unto her father, and to his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. She's the one I want. Don't tell me about what God wants. I want her. We can look into the book of Genesis. We can look into the story of Lot. We can see him lifting up his eyes and looking over the plain of Sodom. And this man who was a righteous man, making a choice not based off of what God would desire for him, but based off what he thought would be best for him financially. And it ruined his family. They were all lost. Today is no different. It's interesting, Brother Lawrence and my father both have been in ministry for several decades. And both of them have the same phrase that they'll sometimes use with me. They'll say this, people are going to do what people want to do. The context in which they both use it with me is generally re reference to ones who are Christians. What can you do, preacher? People are going to do what people want to do. Today, we find churches operating that way. There are churches who do what they do based off of surveys that they've sent out in their community. They want to know what the people want. I've had a church advertisement come to my house before, and they advertised this. They said, the way you always wanted church to be. Another advertisement from a church that I was in, the city of Illinois I was in, and this is what they advertised about their church. Good friends, good fun, and good coffee. And all of them today, the modern church seems to be saying this. Come experience church like you've never experienced it before. And typically God's people, when those experiences get kind of boring, they'll either leave church altogether or find another church where those experiences are still exciting. It's churches operating off of this same foolishness. Doing what seems right in our own eyes. Bringing this down to us today, I wonder, is your life and my life being operated this way? When it comes to our career choices, is God leading us? Or are we simply doing what seems good to us? What's right in our eyes? Are we just following the money? When it comes to our relationships, are they being governed by God's eternal truth? Or do we operate them by what seems right in our own eyes? What about in a husband and wife relationship? By the way, I'll put a little plug in here. We had a great Sunday school today. Message on seven keys to unlocking doors of communication and marriage. It would be great for everyone to hear this out. It was moving. It was very practical. If you'd like a copy of that DVD, I'll, I'll loan it to you, but you got to get back to me because I don't want to lose it. It's a blessing. But in your husband and wife relationship, do you just kind of govern that relationship and what seems good to you? 
Husbands, you're commanded to love your wives as Christ loved the church. To give yourself for her. To love her as your own body. You're commanded to dwell with her according to knowledge. To know what she likes and what she needs. To do your very best to meet it. I wonder, so many husbands today just say, no one can know a woman. And they give up trying. It's not right. That's governing your relationship as you see fit. That's not what God would have you to do. Wives, today I know the feminist movement recoils at such a thought, but God says, wives, submit yourselves to your husband. Amen. I know that many would say, but you don't know what my husband's done to me. That's you governing your relationship as you see fit. God has a standard. God has a truth. And God longs to bless your relationship. God doesn't want what our society is offering. God wants to give you something wholesome, something good, something that will meet and complete your life. But He's not going to give it when we abandon His ways. Amen. When it comes to our relationship as a parent to a child, how do we govern those relationships? The way that we discipline our children, the way that we try to train them up. Is it the way that we see fit? Or the way society would have us to do it? Or is it what God said? Folks, there's a king. We need to do what's right in his eyes. Amen. Talking about dating relationships. Working and workplace relationships. Do you badmouth the boss like everybody else? That's not God's way. Talking about church relationships. You know how often I've seen people in church get upset with a brother or sister in Christ and just run away from it? Become bitter? Give somebody the cold shoulder? If that's you, you're not operating the way God would have you to operate. He's put down in His Word how to handle those offenses. Don't do what seems right in your eyes. And say, there's a king, and I need to please him. When it comes to church ministry, are you seeking to do the Lord's will or just following after what seems good to you? The standard ought not be what others are doing, the guiding light must not be what I think is right or even what I'm comfortable with. The standard is what does the king want? Do I give what seems right to me? Or do I give what He desires? Do I serve how He wants me to or how I want to? Do I respond to His Word as He wants or simply as seems good to me? Do I attend the services and the outreaches and the ministries that God wants? Or do I simply do what's right in my own eyes? I wonder today... If as we look at the problems of our society in the modern church and we seek to fix their problems, if we don't have a beam in our own eye. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Would you turn back with me to Philippians chapter 2? Those words that were read short while ago. In verse number 9 again, the word says, Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him, and given Him, this is Jesus, a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. That's talking about in heaven, on earth today, and those in hell. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. It tells us that there is a name. We need not question today whether there is a king, for we know the king of kings. We've met the Lord of lords. He has a name that is exalted above every name. Many are his names. He's called Wonderful. Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He's Emmanuel, God with us. He's Son of Man and Son of God. He's the Lamb of God. He's the Lion of Judah. He's Alpha and Omega, 
beginning and end. He's the eternal word, the desire of nations, the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. But the sweetest name. The name that charms our fears and bids our sorrows cease. The name that is music in the sinner's ears, life, joy, and peace. It's that highly exalted name. It's Jesus. Jesus, that blessed name. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. In His name we gather and He's in the midst. In His name, we have access to the Father in prayer. In fact, we're told that whatsoever we do, in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus. Greatest of all, He's put His name on us. He says, you are mine. It's therefore not merely our duty, but it is our great delight. But as this verse says, to bow the knee, to loose our tongue, and to declare He is Lord. He's Lord of Lords. He's Lord of all. And most significantly, He's Lord of Practically speaking, then, we live knowing there is a king in our life. And we must do what is right in his eyes. Jesus asked, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? It's his opinion that matters. It's his pleasure we must seek. His glory that we must live for. His command that we must obey. We all saw this week the massacre in Paris. I remember, remember reading the words of one of those cartoonists. He said this, he said, I'd rather die standing than live kneeling. And when it comes to Islam, I wholeheartedly agree. When it comes to Jesus, better live kneeling or you'll die standing. You see, there's a price to pay for a pride and rebellion. It goes before destruction, the Bible declares. Society is reeling like a drunkard, stupefied by the intoxicating effects of pride and lust. Each step takes it closer to the cliff. Likewise, countless lives and relationships, even many churches are daily plunging to their demise because of their reluctance and refusal to bow to kneel before their king. Don't permit your life to be governed by what is right in your eyes. You're serving the wrong king if you do. Rather, let your life be lived with your heart on its knees before the Lord. Let us live out the prayer of thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May we say with Samuel, that great leader of Israel, speak, Lord, for thy servant hears. May our words be that of Isaiah's. Here am I. Send me. As Saul on the road to Damascus. Kneeling beside the road as he met Jesus. May our hearts shout out. Lord what will you have me to do? Amen. Maybe some of us today. Who know. That we're in defiance of the will of God. You know what God has said in some matter. The finger of the Holy Spirit has shown you your error. But you refuse to submit, to bow before the King. Others here perhaps have simply been carried away with life, with its busyness and its cares. It's not that they have intentionally set out to do their own will, but, but that's where they're at. Whether intentionally or not, the obvious need is clear. Bow the knee. Humble yourself before the King. Confess your ways. Seek His grace to change. There is a King. There is a King. There was a chill in the air as dawn began to break on the horizon. The morning dew still heavy on the garden, the courtyard of the Roman government. 
It was no typical morning. In fact, it had been a long night the preceding evening and the early hours of the morning. They'd been up all night. A buzz was in the air. A trial was yet unfinished, though the outcome was certain. <clears throat> As the sun began to rise, the crowds that had gathered began to stir. They would have their way. Their will would not be thwarted. Their thirst for blood must be satiated. There was just one final vote that needed to be cast. Suddenly, everyone's attention in that crowd was drawn to center stage as it was announced that the governor approached. As he stood before the multitude, he was not alone. There beside him was the accused. His face was swollen and bleeding. It was the result of the fist that had pummeled his face, of hands that had torn out his beard by the roots. Yes, that morning there stood Pilate, the Roman governor, and beside him Jesus Christ. As Pilate stood before the people, he met them with a declaration. His words still ring down through the centuries, as does the response of the Jewish crowd that had gathered that day. As he stood before them and presented Jesus to them, he exclaimed, Behold, your king. Alas, and woe for the suffering that has followed the Jewish multitudes as a consequence to their response that day. Upon hearing those words and being given one last opportunity to receive Jesus as their king, those infamous words were instead spoken, We have no king but Caesar. With that, the door of opportunity slammed shut. The Jewish nation, the destruction of their temple, the dispersion of their people, sealed in blood. But we know the rest of the story. They crucified the king. But the king could not be defeated. He rose again. He lives today. And he stands before us this morning. And the word of God says, Behold, your king. How do you respond? Does your life say, not right now. Right now I can have no king. I, I must carry out my will. Or will you from the heart bow your knee? Confess with your mouth. Your Lord of all. Your Lord of lords. And your Lord of There is a king. I want you to understand today that this same king can also be your savior. If you're here this morning and you have never been born again, then you're not part of this kingdom. You must be born into it. Not by physical birth, but by spiritual birth. If you will believe His promise, I'm not asking you today to believe me, but to believe His promise, for it was He who said, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever, that's me, you, everybody, that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you will believe His promise, Respond to Him today. You'll save your soul now and forever. You'll enter into His kingdom. You'll know the greatest King, one full of mercy and compassion, who governs in grace and in true righteousness and justice. He will be your King. Do you know Him today? For the rest of us who do, are we governing our lives as though there is a king? Are we doing what's right in our own eyes? I wonder today, what's the Lord speaking to you about? Let's pray. Father, we come to you. Thank you for your word. 
we rejoice there is a king. Lord, what a privilege to know him. Lord, the one who calms our fears, who causes our sorrows to cease, who brought a new song to our heart, one who brought life and joy and peace. Lord, we're so thankful for Jesus. We praise you for him, for all that he has done.